Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, and welcome to our WJE webinar. My name is Don Minner, and I'll be your moderator today. Our topic for this webinar is preparing your building for compliance with new OSHA rules. This past November, the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration issued a final rule updating its general industry walking, working surfaces standard specific to slip, trip, and fall hazards. The new rule governs a wide variety of conditions, including fixed ladders, low slope roofs, and rope descent systems. The rule also includes a new section under the General Industry Personal Protective Equipment Standard that establishes employer requirements for using personal fall protection systems. Portions of the new rule became effective earlier this month. During the next hour, we will summarize critical portions of the new rule and give an overview of facade access methods and equipment, relative code provisions governing facade access, and the responsibilities of building owners and managers. WJ facade access expert and structural engineers John Lewis, manager of our Chicago office, Gwyneth Sear from our San Francisco office, and Kurt Holloway from our Northbrook, Illinois office, will explain OSHA's requirements, what actions you should take now, and provide more insight into what lies ahead. I remind you that WJ is a registered course provider with the American Institute of Architects, and you are eligible to receive one AIA CES credit for your participation today. At the end of the presentation, we will show slides with more information on how you can obtain that credit. In addition, we will make today's slides available uh, through an email at a later date, and, you and uh, we will also follow up with you afterward for any questions that you may have after the presentation. Well, thank you again for joining us, and now let's get started, and I'll turn it over to John Lewis. Thanks, John. Thanks. Welcome, everyone, to the webinar on this timely topic along with Gwen Sear and Kurt Holloway. We hope to give you a good idea how these recent OSHA changes will impact your buildings and are the activities that you undertake that involve exposure to falls. To start, we'll just go into a little bit of an overview of what's changed in the OSHA guidelines. A new rule was published on November 17th 2016, so just over two months ago, and it took effect on January 17th, just last week. The new rule updates and in some cases completely replaces existing OSHA provisions for work performed at heights on walking working surfaces such as roofs, docks, platforms, on facade access equipment like scaffolding or rope descent systems, and for fixed ladders. Now these provisions apply to work done in general industry, which generally means maintenance type activities and not construction projects. The construction requirements have essentially remained unchanged with the current rulemaking. Now some of the requirements that have taken effect have delayed time frames for compliance while others are fully effective now. Now on balance these new rules create additional owner and by extension additional requirements for contractors and vendors seeking to comply with the OSHA requirements for fall protection. I should say, too, there, there's a lot uh, of other regulations and training requirements and equipment requirements that we will not get into today that also came effective last week, but we'll steer clear of those today for the sake of brevity. For those of you keeping score at home, here's a listing of some of the key sections in the OSHA regulations that have been revised or replaced. Now, both specific requirements and methods for compliance with the requirements have been updated. The figure at the right side of the screen is basically a roadmap that compares the previous OSHA sections in subpart D at the far right with the now current layout. You can see that the changes are quite significant in terms of the affected content in OSHA. It covers both requirements, i.e., what an employer or a worker is supposed to do, as well as the methods i.e. how the worker or employer is to comply with the new requirements. So why these changes and why now? It's an obvious question. If you read through the report on rulemaking that OSHA put out that accompanies the new rule, there are several primary reasons as to why these changes were implemented. First and foremost, OSHA desires to reduce significantly the injuries that occur from falls that exceed four feet. Secondly, the changes were implemented to better align the general industry requirements, again, those for maintenance and non-construction related activities, 
uh, with the construction requirements. The general industry requirements in some cases dated to the early 1970s, whereas the construction requirements are a little bit more recent, dating to the mid-1990s. Also, OSHA says they want to allow a little bit wider array of options for employers to consider as they try to achieve compliance with the fall protection requirements throughout the standard. The rulemaking and public hearings occurred several years ago, and OSHA has made no secret over the past couple of decades, in fact, of its desire to update these provisions. However, the full impact of the requirements as well as how OSHA is going to inter interpret them and apply them is not yet fully clear, uh, fully clear. There's at least one pending lawsuit seeking to throw out portions of these requirements, so we encourage everyone to kind of stay involved, keep checking the OSHA website. If you have a trade representative that works with your building or with your company, stay in touch with them. Stay in touch with firms like WJE. We can keep you updated on how the rulemaking is being applied and implemented by OSHA. Uh, over the next few weeks and months. So to get into some of the specifics, let's start by talking about the requirements for work performed on low slope roofs. So what do we mean when we say a low slope roof? It's not necessarily a roof that has, it doesn't have anything to do with the height of the roof above a lower level, it just has to do with the fact that the slope is relatively flat, it's less than 4 and 12 to be specific. OSHA put forth some new fall protection requirements for maintenance work performed on low slope roofs. The existing regulations, which as I mentioned are several decades old, were both fairly harsh and, and fairly ambiguous, which is a tough combination for folks seeking to comply with the requirements. The new regulations are much better aligned with the construction industry provisions, which divide the roof into a series of zones based upon risk of falling, essentially the distance from an unprotected edge. Keep in mind that an unprotected edge is both at the edge of the roof and any sort of interior opening like a skylight or um, uh, a light cord or something else that's, that's unprotected and could result in a fall. There are now three zones that OSHA describes and provides different requirements for fall protection in each zone. Uh, zone one is for a distance greater than 15 feet from an unprotected edge. Zone two is less than 15 feet but greater than six feet. Zone three is less than six feet from an unprotected edge. Now there's narrow exceptions for pre and post work inspections. Essentially work, essentially inspections or observations that are performed either before or after the actual work task is undertaken. For example, if a building maintenance worker is approaching an edge of a roof to check to see if a gutter is clogged, fall protection may not be required. But OSHA now says that if there is fall protection that is nearby, reasonably available, then that worker has to use it regardless of how quick or how temporary the task uh, or the work is that's being performed. Another example would be an insurance agent expecting, inspecting the edge of the roof for wind damage when evaluating a claim. If there's no fall protection provided on the roof in terms of an anchor point or a guardrail, something of this nature, then the agent is allowed to go make that inspection uh, without using fall protection, but if that fall protection is available, he or she is required to use it. So what does this look like? Zone one, for a distance greater than 15 feet, that's essentially the green area shaded here in the photo. I should state too that OSHA will not refer to these as zones one, two, and three. That's just something that we're including in the talk today for, um, uh, for simplicity, but the requirements do break out based on these distinctions. So let's call this green area, just for sake of argument, zone one. Now, if any work that's being performed in this area, you can always provide full conventional forms of fall protection, even for work that's 200 uh, or more feet from the edge of a roof. However, OSHA does allow some flexibility for work in this area, realizing that the risk of fall is fairly low. You could also provide a warning line at no less than 15 feet from the roof edge uh, to alert workers when they're approaching the edge and to increase their awareness. No fall protection is required for infrequent and temporary work in zone one if there's a work rule that tells workers they have to stay away uh, from the 15 foot perimeter. Temporary and, um, temporary and infrequent being the operative words. Temporary work, meaning a task is very uh, relatively quick to perform, say less than the time it takes to actually implement fall protection. Infrequent is something that maybe is not part of a worker's normal daily routine, maybe something that occurs monthly or, or annually. A good example is uh, replacing a filter on an HVAC unit, maybe adjusting a satellite dish, sealing a skylight joint, 
unclogging a roof drain. These are all examples that OSHA provides in the rulemaking. Now as we move a little bit closer to the roof edge, let's say we're in the yellow zone, zone two. So the distance is less than 15 feet from an edge, but at least six feet. Again, you can provide full conventional fall protection, or if you're doing those same temporary and infrequent work tasks, OSHA will allow the establishment of a designated area, which is essentially a sub area on the roof that's demarcated by a warning line system. Uh, the warning line system is essentially a rope or some sort of um, uh, mechanism that will alert workers as to when they're approaching an edge. Now there's specific requirements for a warning line. It can't be just any old rope or any old flagging, but if you have temporary and infrequent tasks that occur in the zone two area, you can designate an area with a warning line and not have to go with full conventional fall protection for those tasks. Full fall protection would be required for work that is either routine, that is it's done on a regular basis, or that lasts longer than say an hour or two something that's not temporary. As you get to zone three, where the distance is less than six feet, full fall protection of a conventional variety is, is required there. Some of the types are listed on the slide here. And again, as a reminder, there are some narrow exceptions for pre and post work inspection. So let's go through some practical examples here uh, to try to illustrate some of these points. So first off, let's say you have a HVAC unit in zone one, and you have a filter that needs to be replaced. Well, as I alluded to before, this is a temporary or infrequent task. It's more than 15 feet from the roof edge. If the employer has and enforces a rule that prohibits workers from going more than or going closer than 15 feet to the edge, then no fall protection would be required for this activity. Same activity, but now let's say that it occurs in zone two. So it's less than 15 feet from the edge, but more than six feet from the edge. Again, it's still a temporary and infrequent task, but in this case, the employer would have to establish a warning line around the equipment, at least six feet from the roof edge, realizing the heightened risk of a fall. That way the worker would know that they're approaching a roof edge and would stop their activity before they got too close. The six foot distance is established because OSHA believes that at a distance less than six feet, an accidental trip or slip could result in enough momentum to propel a worker over the roof edge. This activity, if it were to take place in zone three, uh, full conventional fall protection would be required around the unit. Now let's switch it up a little bit. Let's say that it's not just replacing a filter, but you have some sort of longer term HVAC repair that needs to be done to a unit that's located in zone one. Again, it's greater than 15 feet from the edge, but it's no longer temporary work. Uh, it still may be infrequent, but it's not temporary. So in this case, what would need to happen is there, the, the employer would have to erect a warning line between the point on the roof where roof access is gained and the work area and keep that warning line up until the work is complete. Now if we do the same thing, again, longer term repairs at a unit that's located in zone two, because it's not temporary work, we can no longer use a designated area uh, that, that is allowed in zone two for temporary tasks. So in this case, the, work, the employer would have to install a guardrail in zone two or provide some other form of conventional fall protection like uh, fall arrest or fall restraint or safety net. And in addition, they would have to install a warning line for the area in zone one that's used to access the work area in zone two, essentially as shown uh, in, the, in the figure at right. Now extrapolating this out, WJE in some cases has been asked by owners uh, of of buildings, especially roofs that have a lot of different equipment, have a lot of different activities that occur from time to time. You don't necessarily want to have to set up fall protection for each specific activity. You may like to think ahead and say, okay, what kind of methods can we put up um, now so that we know that we can cover these activities and not have to have a specific evaluation done for each, uh, for each activity. That's kind of what's shown conceptually in the photo here. In this case, the employer may want to establish, or building owner may want to establish a warning line around the zone one area, 15 feet from the edge. And in the spots where they have equipment or, or need to get up close to the edge of the roof fairly frequently, they may install a guardrail or a conventional form of fall protection at those areas so they know if any worker that goes up there, they have a reasonable approach that will provide protection. So with that, I will turn it over to Gwen. Uh, who will talk a little bit about facade access. 
Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Gwen Sear. I work out of the uh, San Francisco office of WISJANI. I'm going to be talking about facade access equipment and methods, and then a little bit about fixed ladders. So facade access, um, that includes cleaning, like window washing, it includes maintenance, and it includes inspections and repairs. It might also include hanging of signs or holiday lights on the side of your building. Um, it also includes uh, powered platforms, scaffolds that hang over the side of the building. Uh, sometimes these things are fairly complicated. They may run on rails around the perimeter of the building, or in the case of the piece of equipment on the right, it runs around just on wheels, but it's powered, it moves around, it's heavy. Uh, okay, so let me just talk quickly about the pieces of equipment. This shows um, some davits. Yeah, the pink arrows point to the davit, uh, davits or davit arms. They reach over the side of the building. The yellow arrow, arrows point to the pedestals or davit bases. They're connected to the structure of the building. They provide rigidity to the base of the davit. The red arrow, it's sort of hard to see because of the, the black uh, guardrail, but behind or beyond the black guardrail is a platform. That's the window washing rig that the workers stand on. The green arrows point to the hoist, the motors that pull this up and down the building. This is a photo of a typical davit base. They come in all sorts of flavors and sizes but they basically provide the structural support for the davits themselves. Um, this shows a, a worker sitting on what's called a bosun's chair, uh, also called controlled descent apparatus. This is sort of the minimalist equipment. Uh, the support consists of a working line where the worker's weight is uh, supported directly. And then a fall arrest line, if something bad happens to the working line, it gets cut or severed or, or whatever, the worker then uh, has a safety attachment to the fall arrest line that prevents them from falling a significant distance. Those lines are typically connected to rooftop anchorages on the top of the building, the roof of the building. And they come in all sorts of flavors, but they usually look like this, they have a half loop that the worker can attach the line to, and then they're anchored to the structure of the building. Horizontal lifelines, you're building, these are less common, but they're, they're out there. They have to be designed, uh, they're, they're designed as substantially more complicated because of the, the horizontal nature of the cable. Um, they have to be designed installed and used under the supervision of a qualified person. So they're, they're actually pretty, um, there's stringent requirements on these, the horizontal lifelines. OSHA, so there's lots of regulations governing these. There's OSHA, there's also state and local codes. In some cases, there will be a state OSHA. Sometimes there, there won't be. California, where I work, has a state OSHA. And those rules actually supersede, well, they don't supersede, but they work in, in concert with the federal rules. There are also other standards, and I'll talk about these. So OSHA regulations for facade access. Um, Pre-2017, there were just two segments that largely dealt with facade access. Now they've broken it up into uh, some substantially smaller chunks. Uh, hopefully more usable chunks and a little bit clearer. There are also building codes. The 2015 International Building Code now covers the structural design requirements for facade access equipment. 1607.9.3 uh, and .4 cover davits, outriggers, anchorages, and their supports. And section 1708 covers in situ uh, load tests of that equipment. ASCE 716 also covers structural design requirements for facade access equipment. And ACI 318 and AISC 360 cover in situ load test requirements for anything that's either concrete related or steel related of this equipment. 
There may be other regulations, as I said. There, there may be uh, state OSHA uh, organizations. Uh, there may also be a local city uh, ordinance that may cover this. The OSHA regulations still apply, and the building code and reference standards still apply. So if you if you're if you're in a city where the the city has adopted and the state has adopted the International Building Code 2015 or even the 2018 which is going to be coming out soon, you have to comply with both OSHA requirements and the IBC. There are some other standards. The Z359 Fall Protection Standard System. It's a very detailed set of requirements. It is voluntary, but it's often referenced in terms of uh, the equipment and rope access systems, fall arrest systems, and rescue systems. Sometimes you may hear reference to the IWCA uh, I-14.1 standard, window cleaning safety. That's the International Window Cleaners Association. That's a, a highly technically flawed document that was developed in 2001. It was actually administratively withdrawn by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, in 2011. It's had its accreditation twice suspended by ANSI due to the number and severity of issues involving equity and fair play that were identified during audits and appeals. And its accreditation was permanently withdrawn by ANSI in November of last year due to numerous failures to provide equity and fair play and, and failure to follow their own rules. This standard has, has been discredited. It uh, should not be cited. It's, it's a problematic standard for many reasons. And we'll even show you how that's affecting these new requirements in a minute. Occasionally, consultants may reference the A120.1 standard safety requirements for powered platforms and traveling ladders and gantries for building maintenance, which is a mouthful. Uh, they unfortunately copied a number of IWCA provisions, the technically flawed provisions, into their standard. So they have technical, similar technical problems. Per ASME, the Association, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the A120.1 is an advisory standard. Compliance is completely voluntary. If it's voluntary and you have state requirements or code requirements that, that legally govern, those govern over any voluntary standard. Uh, scaffolding. So powered platforms used for maintenance are still governed by the 1910.66 provisions with some minor changes. You do require an initial certification, monthly inspections, and annual recertification. Contractor provided equipment. That's where a contractor will bring out a swing stage, a work platform, assemble it on the ground usually, and then drop lines down to it and raise it up the side of the building. That now gets the requirements for that type of equipment is now redirected to the requirements for scaffolding used in construction. So, but it, it's similar requirements as before, but now you find those requirements in a different location. The new section 1910.27 codifies the use of rope descent systems, RDS. And again, that's bosun's chairs or controlled descent apparatus, CDAs. Uh, you, you must have a designated anchorage. Uh, you can't just let the workers go up to your building and say, well, there's a column I'm going to tie off to that. That column, if they're going to tie off to that column, it needs to have been uh, designated as an anchorage. They can't just make it up on the fly. So if, if there's a bunch of stuff on your roof, but it's not clear that it's actually able to hold the 5,000 pounds, which is the requirement, and it's a fairly stringent requirement, um, you're probably you might want to consider adding anchorages, designated, dedicated anchorages that the workers see, just like we saw earlier with the half loop. They see those anchorages and they say, aha, that's what I need to tie off. To. There are additional usage and training requirements associated with those as well. 
Now there are, as John said, there's significant questions and uncertainties. There is a pending lawsuit in federal court. Corporate Cleaning Services has appealed the 300-foot limit. There's a 300-foot limit for rope descent systems where if your building's taller than 300 feet, you're not supposed to use rope descent systems anymore uh, unless there's no other way to do it. So Corporate Cleaning Services has initiated a federal lawsuit uh, regarding this. They're actually looking for people to join their lawsuit. Um, so we don't know how that's going to affect OSHA's interpretation of this and, and how that, maybe that rule will get canceled. We don't know. Level of enforcement. Again, these are all new rules, largely, and there's 88 pages of them. And it, it's not clear how stringently OSHA is going to enforce them. They don't, we don't have case history on that, and we don't have letters of interpretation on these new rules. Uh, anchorage requirements, right now at least, seem to only apply to rope descent systems, bosun's chairs and CDAs, uh, not scaffolding. That maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. We don't know how OSHA is going to interpret that. So it, it does seem like it's a good time for thorough review of your building-specific equipment and, and methods that you use to do facade access. Quickly talking about fixed ladders. Uh, if you have an industrial building like a tilt-up, a warehouse, the, the ladder on the left may get you access to a roof. The roof via the middle photo shows a roof hatch. These are fixed ladders and access to the roof. And then the, the photo on the right, you, your building may have ladders from lower points on the roof to higher points on the roof or ladders to get up to HVAC equipment. You may be surprised to find that your building actually has a decent number of ladders if you actually look around. Um, OSHA has pretty detailed requirements for fixed ladders. And they, they've been in, there in the regulations for a long time. It governs rung size, length, spacing of the rungs, distances from the ladders to the to obstructions. Uh, ladders need to have side rail extensions. They have to comply with certain dimensions. And cages, that's what's shown in the photo on the right. Some ladders, if they're long enough, need to have cages. The intent was to make ladders as safe as possible. Some things were always a bad idea. For example, the, the ladder on the right, if you look closely, you can see that the, the ladder jogs outward at the very top. That's not allowed. What, what probably happened here was the designer was trying to meet one requirement, which is you need seven inches from your rung to your building face, but the building has a cornice. So the designer said, oh, I need to bump out the ladder. Unfortunately, bumping out the ladder like this means that you're, you're trying to resist gravity as you, you, you basically have an angle on your ladder that's greater than 90 degrees. And so you're sort of hanging. In addition, it's difficult to go over a, a change like this, uh, an abrupt change in the direction of the ladder, particularly oriented in this direction. The other way would be less difficult. Uh, this is a violation of uh, OSHA requirements. So while some things were always a bad idea, other thing, things seem like a good idea, but maybe they're, they don't do what, quite what we thought. Cages, for example, they tend not to stop falls. They do direct the person who's falling to a specific spot right below the ladder, um, but it really doesn't stop you from falling. Uh, it, it can. But generally, if you, if you fall more than a foot or two, you're going to build up so much speed that you're not going to be able to stop yourself, even if you throw out your arms and try. So the new rules include more stringent requirements for fixed ladders. They're covered in 1910.23. And for fixed ladders greater than 24 feet, what I'll call tall ladders, there's another section, 1910.28b9, that covers those or has additional requirements for those. Uh, I'm going to talk about the tall ladders because they're the bigger safety hazard generally. Existing tall ladders installed before November 19, 2018 must have a personal fall arrest system, a ladder safety system, a cage, or a well. So if it's an existing 
bladder, you're going to have to have to comply with that. Um, but as I so, told you, the uh, the cages are not maybe the best idea. So new tall ladders, OSHA recognizes that new tall ladder ladders installed on or after November 19, 2018, must have either a personal fall arrest system, so a rope that you grab with uh, a rope grab and that you wear a harness, or a ladder safety system. Again, that requires a uh, harness and you clip on to a rail that goes up and down the ladder. And it, it limits you, if you do fall, it limits your fall to a, a fairly small distance. So the forces are lower and less chance of you getting significantly injured. Now there's a little bit of confusion here. For tall ladders or portions thereof that are replaced, they must have a personal fall arrest system or a ladder safety system in the area of replacement. Now you note that there's no date here. The other two requirements had dates, so it's not clear if you have an existing ladder but you replaced the whole thing, what date is the trigger for that? Uh, in addition, just the practicality of implementing this may be problematic. For example, if you, if you replace a rung on a ladder, how would you put a, a personal fall arrest system in for that rung? Because that's what it says. Maybe you just have to bite the bullet and put in a personal fall arrest system for the whole ladder, even if you're just doing a small modification. And by November 18th, 2036, all tall ladders must have a personal fall arrest system or a ladder safety system. So again, they're getting away from cages. They don't want to see cages. They don't want to see wells. They want to see something that stops you from falling within a, a foot or two, basically. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kurt, who's going to talk about compliance strategies. Thanks, Glenn. We've uh, given you all a lot of information to digest here. Um, would like to spend a few minutes talking about how we systematically approach a safer workplace and chase after OSHA compliance. If we're not there already, how can we work toward it, or how can we maintain it in light of these new rules? Next question, are we compliant? There's so many changes with these new regulations. Uh, interpretations of many of them are unclear. There's so many topics. Where do we begin? Hopefully by now you're already identifying some areas where your own operations may be affected by the new OSHA rules and action is needed to reach or remain in compliance. But how do we tackle this thing? First, I'd like to briefly touch on two misconceptions about OSHA compliance and highlight an appropriate conceptual framework for systematically dealing with fall protection issues. The very first thing is that we need to, need to dispense with the notion that OSHA compliance alone will automatically make you safe, quote unquote. OSHA compliance, remember, is the minimum legal requirement, and other local rules may be more stringent. It doesn't address every building or every situation and won't by itself result in a safe workplace. One concept used throughout safety engineering, whether it's fall protection or other types of safety hazards and, and their abatement, is the hierarchy of control. To boil that down, basically not all compliant protection provides the same level of safety. In light of fall protection, every fall protection system or strategy, short of completely eliminating the hazard, possesses some degree of residual risk. For example, a guardrail, passive fall protection system, doesn't require the worker to do anything once it's in place. It's less defeatable and actually prevents the fall from occurring. Whereas an active fall arrest system relies heavily on the worker to properly use their PPE equipment and the anchorage that they're tethering to to be effective and will still allow the fall to occur, requiring prompt rescue and having a higher residual risk of injury even when everything else goes right. Remember, OSHA requires prompt quote unquote rescue to avoid worker suspension trauma. If you're hanging in a harness, uh, your blood vessels are constricted and further uh, damage to your body can occur even after the fall has been arrested. The point is, remember there are a wide range of compliant fall protection options available to you to a lesser degree with respect to facade access, but there's still options available within each area, and each of those options has their own trade-off. The second concept we'd like to sort of debunk here a little bit is that compliance is equivalent to risk management. Selection of appropriate and compliant facade access or fall protection systems should acknowledge the needs and operations of your organization. 
all work at height possesses some level of remaining risk. That risk is yours. The question is, how will you manage it? Some helpful questions that we like to raise when you're trying to assess your hazards and work tasks, you need to think about where's your greatest risk. You want to prioritize spending the, the resources you have available. If you're chasing after compliance and safety, you want to prioritize those resources so that you're getting the most bang for your buck. Some other helpful things to think about when you're trying to prioritize. What work do we need to do up there and where? How often do we need to do that work? What am I willing to pay for compliance? Are aesthetics important? How will fall protection affect other building systems? Most importantly, probably the roof for many buildings. What will permanent dedicated systems cost me operationally on, a, on an ongoing recurring basis in the form of testing, certification, training for my employees or contractors working with these systems? maintenance of the systems, and inspection of these, these systems. Circling back now to that question, are we compliant? With that mindset, with those concepts in mind, first things first, focus on the key dates that are coming up in these new regulations. What will you need to change in your maintenance operations this year? If you've got a building over 300 feet high, you already know that this rope descent system restriction uh, is in place, and a majority of the other new rules that are in the OSHA regulations are already in effect. Another big one is May 17th. Uh, employers need to provide training for their employees with respect to fall protection. By November 20th, rope descent systems, where those are going to continue to be used, we need to have all of our anchorages identified and certified and tested. Looking ahead in the longer term, ladders are a major thing that need to be dealt with if you have many of them. So to make an action plan, we'd like to suggest that you first begin by assessing your hazards, operations, and the risks. OCHA requires assessment anyways, as is uh, stipulated in 1910.132D, particularly with respect to falling and falling object hazards. And that assessment needs to be documented. But in practice, this makes sense to do anyways. Once you've identified non-compliances and hazards, how your work tasks and operations interface with these, you can prioritize your actions to address the areas of greatest risk first. Specifically with regard to training and that May 17th deadline, uh, employers must provide uh, anyone who's using personal fall protection systems training that training has to be done by a qualified person, which is a very specific definition within OSHA of what that means. Uh, essentially, it needs to be somebody very well versed in the subject matter and has some recognized uh, experience or certified experience. And they have to be trained on not only the nature of the hazard, but also the procedures and methods to minimize their exposure to those hazards. And if they're using equipment, they need to be trained on the installation, inspection, usage, uh, care of that equipment, all of these things need to be happening on some, in some form by May 17th of this year. Touching again on low slope roofs and fall protection needs there, you may recognize rightfully so that there are a wide variety of options available to you. Selection of the right option for you should be based on your operational preferences, the work tasks that need to be done, and their frequency and duration and the distance that those work tasks are occurring from roof edges. There are a lot of good options. For you, it might be a permanent guardrail system all the way around the edge of your building. It might be anchorages are the right way to go. Guardrail doesn't always have to be permanent. It could be portable or even collapsible, like this bottom photo here, one that lays down on your roof out of sight, out of mind when it's not being used and just pops up and locks into place. Or it could be something less, less heavy duty, like warning lines, or even a simple work plan or administrative control that's documented or a buddy system that's put into place uh, might be all that you need on your particular low slope roof. Touching on ladders again, we'd like to emphasize a simple strategy that focuses on that 20 year time frame from now, that November 18th, 2036 deadline. Because ladders are fairly permanent things. Permanent fixed ladders, if you think about the few or maybe you have many uh, on your facilities that exist, they're probably about as old as your facility. In, in our experience, new ladders are, are, are sort of infrequent. 
when you are replacing a ladder, it's usually for good cause due to deterioration or its condition. So if you're going to mess with a ladder at all, focus on where it needs to be for the long term. Uh, the, co the relative cost difference in putting a personal fall rest system or a climbing safety system on a ladder that's being updated or replaced is minimal compared to the cost of dealing with that ladder a couple different times uh, to sort of play the short game. With respect to facade access systems, let's touch on rope descent systems again. We know that we have to find a new solution if we're at heights over 300 feet. Anchorages, it's, we want to emphasize that a qualified person, that specific definition, a qualified person must be the one to identify, test, cert, and certify that they have that 5,000 pound capacity that's required. And that has to happen in about 10 months from now. Once you've got the certification in place, again, start programming and thinking about that every 10 years, OSHA is going to require that that to be renewed with interim inspections on an annual basis by a qualified person, again, in between. And keep in mind that this, the new regulations emphasize and put this additional onus on the building owner to provide that certification documentation to a degree that they have not ever done before. Um, and that it boils down to there's not going to be self-selection or anchorage by workers up there picking their own anchorages for rope descent. Uh, even if it's a 36-inch deep concrete beam that most people would not suspect or, or, or worry about, uh, it needs to be at least identified and, and certified by a qualified person before people are self-selecting that as their anchorage. And the building owner has to provide that documentation. With regard to suspended scaffolds, Powered platform regulations under 1910-66, again, only minor changes to those under the new rules. Keep in mind, practically speaking, though, when it comes to um, anchorages in particular, a permanent anchorage on the roof, if it's intended for tieback of suspension equipment for powered platforms, may very likely be used for rope descent systems at some point and or for roof fall protection when a worker's accessing the roof edge. So unless you have kind of absolute control over how anchorages on a roof are being used, anybody going up on a roof sees an anchorage, and an anchorage for rope descent looks a lot like an anchorage for tieback, looks a lot like an anchorage for fall arrest. And so it's appropriate to consider the most stringent provisions governing anchorages from each class until you have, unless you have that tight control over usage at your facility. With respect to davits, there's nothing new there. They need to be tested and certified and annually inspected. And again, that documentation requirement is on the owner to provide those assurances to all the folks using that equipment. Now, one thing that all the facade access equipment and systems that they have in common is this common sort of thread of load testing or testing as a basis for certification. We'd like to briefly dig into some clarifications about load testing and facade access equipment, which OSHA requires, and some common pitfalls to avoid when you're pursuing that certification testing. Chief among the pitfalls is some poor practices that are so widely used throughout the industry that on the surface may still bear that certified stamp of approval, but in reality may significantly undermine the value and accuracy of the testing. First of these practices I'd like to post point out is that uh, when we do load testing, it should be done to the full required capacity of the components that are being tested. Many practitioners in the industry, based on uh, withdrawn and discredited uh, requirements in the A120 and I14 standards, limit load testing, uh, test loads to one half of the required strength. And many folks still adhere to these uh, so-called standards, even though they are uh, have been replaced and supplanted by uh, things that carry the weight of law and also things that are technically uh, much more on the mark. The reasons for half-load testing are often given as, oh, well, we don't want to damage the roofing, oh, we don't want to damage the equipment, and, and these don't really carry much weight. To sort of dig into this issue a little bit further, Indulge us in, in a little logic challenge that you don't have to be a structural engineer to appreciate. It demonstrates the dilemma of not testing a structure to the full required load that it legally must carry. 
you and two other hikers that you're walking with come to two bridges of unknown strength across a jungle torrent, as shown here. One hiker, who weighs 200 pounds, chooses to walk across the bridge on the left. The second hiker, who weighs 100 pounds, chooses to walk across the bridge on the right. You weigh 180 pounds. You know that the bridge on the left was tested with 200 pounds and held it, and you know that the bridge on the right was tested only with 100 pounds. Which bridge do you, who weigh 180 pounds, walk across? Most people, I think you would agree, would choose the bridge that was just proven to be able to carry the 200 pounds. Now, tying this back into facade access equipment, recall that the hoist stall loads for these motors can stall out at up to 67% of the OSHA required strength, which is over the half load. To sort of further underscore uh, some pitfalls and challenges with load testing is that these load tests need to test the equipment in the directions they're actually going to be used in service. Testing one way doesn't structurally mean that the assembly is automatically sound for the load in any direction. It's okay when you're doing load testing to define or restrict the directions and equipment may be used based on the directions it's likely to actually be used or needed to be used on your building. If testing in directions is not feasible, if it's not needed, or cost effective. But should we ever be testing in directions that equipment is not going to be used in service? Here we're showing a test parallel to the roof edge when the loads are really going to be applied over the roof edge. That's a no-no. In WJ's experience, these issues are real and they do matter. Uh, we've seen numerous equipment failures over the, over the years, and while OSHA simply requires testing and certification to be compliant and doesn't define the methods or loads by which that's to be done, it is imperative that the testing be done in a proper manner as evidenced by these failures that we've observed over the years. Question to you, how valuable is a letter of certification based on an improper test? In this case, we have some failures of davit arms here in, in our structural testing laboratory in Northbrook where these davit arms failed at approximately half the load as demonstrated by the, the load cell on the right uh, by yielding of the arms. They just sort of keeled over and failed to hold any further load. If that's a whole hoist motor stalling on these arms, the thing would continue to bend in half and utter failure might occur. Davit bases can also fail. We, We've seen in the field with load testing numerous instances where these things have failed under uh, just over half the loads that they're required to carry, where they've failed at just shy of the full OSHA required loads, oftentimes via brittle fracture of weld, weldments that were not properly done, uh, poor and insufficient weld quality. Um, so we've had some unique opportunities in the position that we're in to autopsy and investigate these failures after we've, we've had them in the field. In the case of the data bases just shown, uh, we opened up the roof and were able to look at things from, from beneath that were concealed. And this is why the test is done, to identify these concealed either defects or deterioration. Uh, and the reality is some of the tests on this building, uh, the assembly, the data base was able to carry the full OSHA required load in one direction, but not in another. And what this underscores is three things. The need to test to the full OSHA required load, the importance of testing in the proper direction or in multiple directions when those elements can be loaded in multiple directions because you don't know where that hidden defect is going to lie. And then finally, the underscore, the need to test each and every installation or component. We can't just test a sample of these and know that each and every one is good. Uh, there's not really a statistical or structural justification for such practices. But, but yet, there are folks out there in the industry who continue to adhere to those practices. Moving on from load testing uh, toward the end, with regard to anchorages, you hear a lot about turnkey anchorage installation, which can be a great solution for a lot of buildings. And by turnkey, we mean design, fabrication, installation, and testing. Uh, certification is all kind of carried out in one-stop shop, uh, one provider. They will uh, give you a lot of value. Uh, with that approach uh, can be realized if anchorages are truly the right solu solution for your facility. But beware, uh, some of these turnkey folks are ones that provide half load testing. Beware that turnkey folks who want to sell anchorages are trying to sell you anchorages. And so there may be other solutions that are more appropriate for 
the operational needs and objectives of your uh, organization. And it's important to remember that anchorages and that personal follow rest systems are just one option and that they rely on PPE and think back to that hierarchy control, they may not be the most effective or uh, best risk management approach to fall protection for your situation. WJ has been a turnkey provider of anchorages in certain situations. Uh, these are photos from a, a job where we've provided anchorages before. Uh, and we can do things that are, are custom to the needs of our clients as they see fit for their facility. Uh, another thing that we get into frequently is troubleshooting problems with existing systems. If something has failed a load test, it doesn't mean you have to start over. Uh, or if my certification has lapsed, do I have to go back to the drawing board? And the answer is no. Uh, a qualified person who objectively works with you to identify the best fall protection and decide access approaches for your facility can provide a lot of ability to design, modify, repair, and recertify systems as needed. Just a few summary thoughts on the way forward. Uh, would encourage you to assess and audit your hazards, work tasks and access needs, and the existing equipment you have. Prioritize your approach to compliance and to safety and manage that risk that you perceive. Be mindful of compliance deadlines and the documentation requirements that are just put in place. And finally, leverage qualified persons available uh, within or outside your organization to help identify the right solutions for your unique situation. With that, I thank you for your attention and would certainly open it up to questions. And I encourage you to reach out to any one of us afterwards if we can't get to your question now. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Um, let's start with the first question we have. Uh, and uh, this came in. Uh, what is the difference between industrial rope access techniques and rope descent systems? Uh, anyone, John, can you field that? Sure, yeah, this is John. Uh, it's a good question. Um, there's a lot of differences between industrial rope access and, and rope descent systems, even though they may look somewhat similar. Uh, just a few of them, there's a lot more training and a lot more certification that's required for industrial rope access. Uh, WJE uses this a lot for our difficult access team when we inspect building facades or other structures that are difficult to access using conventional means like uh, suspended scaffolding. There's a lot of oversight and management that's specific to rope access. There's a um, uh, several trade groups or professional organizations, SPRAT and ARADA, that, uh, that handle that. One of the other things is that industrial rope access techniques are multidirectional. You can go up as well as down, where, as you might imagine from a rope descent system, the word descent is operative and that you, know, you can really only go down. Um, I, again, I mean, there, there's many, many differences that, that separate industrial rope access techniques from rope descent systems, and OSHA seems to realize this in the rulemaking. Uh, they recognize that a lot of the different commenters who uh, weighed in on the new requirements for rope descent system were, were pretty adamant that they're not the same. IRAs are not the same as RDSs. But again, there's not any regulatory history on how OSHA is going to actually interpret that. Is it possible that somebody is doing industrial rope access techniques and a OSHA inspector walks by and, and it picks his or her interest? Yeah, for sure. Um, but at least based on the rulemaking, it sounds like OSHA realizes these differences, but wait and see how it gets, uh, how it gets interpreted and how it gets adjudicated in practice. Hey, thank you, John. Here's another question. As a facade maintenance contractor and with the, withdraw with the withdraw withdrawal excuse me, of the IWCA I-14, uh, which never had teeth, what suggestions do you have for building owners not interested in designating anchorages or installing rooftop anchorages? Do the new OSHA regs provide any more leverage for the contractor? Kurt, you want to take that? Sure, sure, Don. Um, I think in general, the OSHA regulations do uh, provide, I, I, through one lens, more leverage uh, for the contractor in that they're very clear in, with a, particularly with regard to rope descent, in putting that, that onus on the building owner uh, to provide this documentation of anchorage identification and certification. It is not permitted uh, anymore 
for, uh, say, a window cleaner to go up on a roof, and if the owner has not provided anchorages, uh, the window cleaners previously have been able to tie off to, again, that 36-inch deep concrete beam. Well, in practice and, and by law, uh, that beam at least needs to be identified and certified in writing by the building owner that it's a suitable thing for the window cleaner to tie off to. Um, and so self-selection of anchorages or non-certified anchorages, at least when it comes to rope descent, is, is not permitted. Uh, that requirement is, is not been changed specifically with regard to anchorages for powered platforms, which is uh, admittedly seems somewhat inconsistent and, and maybe is still something that OSHA needs to provide some interpretation on. Uh, we don't know for sure what they're going to have to say about that, but they do require fall arrest systems uh, to, to provide 5,000 pound capacity uh, for um, those anchorages when you're on a powered platform. And for the suspension equipment and tiebacks themselves, those have to be certified by the building owner and always have been. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Uh, here's another one. Are the protection requirements for fixed ladders only for ladders over 24 feet? Gwen, uh, can you answer that? Yeah. Um, so the, there are two sets of provisions of requirements. Um, one covers all ladders and one covers ladders over 24 feet. The, the series of slides that we showed with the tall ladders, the tall ladders are greater than 24 feet, those are going to need a ladder safety system or a fall arrest system. Um, the shorter ladders don't have that requirement, but they have a ton of other requirements, just like the tall ladders, including rung size, rung width, distance from the building, uh, how, how the side rails extend up beyond the ladder to provide a safe access to the ladder at the top, stuff like that. Okay, thank you. And it uh, looks like we have time for uh, one more question. And, and I know we have lots of uh, questions out there and we appreciate that. We'll, we'll try and uh, take all these and contact you individually. And we'll also provide some information on how you can contact us. So for our last question today, uh, if an employer has been using computer-based training for fall protection, does the new standard now only allow classroom training by a competent person? John, is that something you can answer? I'm not clear on that specific question. Um, there are some there are some new training requirements. I'm not sure if OSHA delves into the means and methods in which that training is delivered. More on the content, Kurt. Is that something that that you can speak to? Yeah, I've reviewed the provisions, and and I don't think it's very clear in the OSHA regulations themselves what how that training needs to be documented or by what means that training needs to occur. What is clear is the content of the training uh, that we touched on in the slides. That it needs to be for all uh, workers using fall protection systems. Uh, has to cover the nature of the hazards again, uh, how to how to mitigate uh, and procedures, um, and then anything and everything having to do with the equipment that they must use. Okay, uh, thank you, Kurt, and thank you everyone for joining us today. You'll see on the screen right now the names of uh, the folks who you can contact: uh, John, Gwen, and Kurt, and their information. It's also that information is on wj.com. But as I mentioned, we will follow up with each of you with an email that includes a link to uh, today's webinar as well. And then finally, here's a slide that shows you the information on getting your uh, CE credit for today. So once again, thank you for joining our webinar today and have a great day.